Well, good morning. It is good to be together this morning. Uh, this weather has been great. I hope you're enjoying the coolness. Um, just a few announcements as we begin this morning. Uh, first, a prayer meeting Tuesday at Pete Bowers' home, 7 p.m. Addresses in the bulletin. A second, the elders' meeting is this Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, you're welcome to join us in person or on Zoom, and the details are also there in the bulletin. Uh, the Lindsay family, you know, sometimes you try to get rid of people, but they just kind of hang on. Uh, their um, departure has been postponed by the military, and so uh, we're going to delay the uh, farewell fellowship until they're actually about to go, so that there's not a long, drawn-out, like, I thought I said bye to you already, and you're still here. Um, so sometime in late June, maybe, is that still roughly, maybe, yeah, okay. Um, they, we will update you as soon as we have more information on that. Uh, and then lastly, just a reminder, uh, community groups are a great way uh, to have fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to encourage one another, to help each other grow. Um, so uh, that is it for our announcements. Let's pray together this morning. God, our Father, we praise you as the glorious and majestic creator God of the universe, the one who has called all things into existence by the word of your power. Uh, May you be exalted and lifted up in all things and in our service this morning. Father, we confess that we have hearts that are far from you. We focus too much on ourselves, on our own desires, our own wants. That we're too concerned with worldly things, what we should eat or what we should wear. That too often we have little of thoughts of you. We're quick to turn away to sin, to pursue worldly desires. We fail to serve one another well. We fail to love one another as you have called us to do. And so, Father, we praise you that despite who we are of our own nature, in love you chose us for salvation. And you sent your Son to redeem us, and you have called us to, your, to yourself, and you have saved us through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And it's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Our call to worship is from Isaiah But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Let's worship our God together this morning. Please stand as we begin our worship with uh, singing Mighty to Save.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 19 through 25. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Let's pray. Our, our Father, we, we praise you. We praise you as the almighty God. And we thank you, Father, that you loved us enough that you committed your love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, we acknowledge before you our shortcomings. We are sinners. We sin against you in thought and word and deed. And we are so thankful for you your forgiveness in Christ. We thank you, Father, that you make us as white as snow because he has shed his blood for us and taken upon himself the punishment for our sins. Lord, I pray this morning that as we gather here together, we would be thankful, thankful for the opportunity that we have to meet in a place free from fear of oppression or persecution for doing so. Thank you for the, ability, the availability of the word of God. We can read your word, we can hear it preached, and Father, we need to not take this for granted. We know that many places around the world do not have such wonderful freedoms. And Lord, <coughs> I pray this morning, I pray that you would help us, help us to love you with all our heart and soul and mind. Father, help us to love one another as Christ has loved us. And Lord, we pray <coughs> that your word today, as we hear uh, Daniel preach from the book of Romans, that your word would not fall upon deaf ears, Father, but that we would be instructed and challenged and motivated to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ as we apply the truths of your word to our lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me as we recite the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> I believe in one God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy universal church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We uh, continue our worship this morning. His mercy is more. Yeah. 
be seated. If you have children, kindergarten and younger, you're welcome to take them to children's ministry at this time, if that would be helpful for you. If you're visiting, you may have been wondering why we didn't put up the words to the Nicene Creed. That's just one of the requirements of being here is that you memorize it. (laughs) Uh, Now that was missing inadvertently, Chris. I don't know if you even noticed, but great job just pushing right through that. Um... I was good for most of the first paragraph, and then after that, it's a little rougher. This past summer, my wife reminded me that we had some dead branches in our trees that we needed to trim. She, she may have mentioned these dead branches in previous years as well. So as you would expect, I got on top of it right away. But the leaves had all fallen off the trees, being that it was already December when I got to it. So we couldn't tell which branches were dead and which ones were alive. They all looked the same. Uh, so we had to wait till the spring to trim the branches, and we did take care of it this spring. And now it's really easy to see what was alive and what was dead. Uh, all the living branches had leaves on them. The dead branches were bare. Uh, The living branches were flexible and full of life, and the dead branches were hard and dry. So we cut off all the dead branches now that we could tell them apart. We cut them into small pieces to get picked up by the city and shredded. They were nothing but a nuisance to be cut off and cast away. On the other hand, the healthy branches are cared for and protected, while the dead branches are cut off and discarded. Well, this morning, we're going to see that we are all branches in one of God's trees. If we're united to Jesus Christ by faith, then we are safe in God's arms. But if we do not hold to Christ by faith, we will be cut off and discarded. Faith is what distinguishes God's true people from those on the outside. Go ahead and turn in your own Bible to the book of Romans, if you would. This morning we're in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 24. If you're using one of the church Bibles, you'd find that on page 946, right about three-fourths of the way through your Bible, page 946. The New Testament begins about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. And there you see the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you have the book of Acts, and then you get to Romans. Again, this morning we're going to look at Romans chapter 11. Those are the big numbers. So we're going to begin in verse 1, which probably doesn't actually mention the number 1. You'll just see the big 11 for chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. Verse 4, but what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Verse 7, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. Nine, and David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. 
So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order, that, in order to make my fellow Jews jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back in to their own olive tree? Let's pray together this morning. Father, it's such a joy to gather together with your people, to gather around your truth, to proclaim your glory and majesty. Father, help us this morning to love one another, to build one another up, to encourage one another through these words, through your truth, because of your honor and glory and majesty, because of your grace and mercy that you've poured out freely on us. Father, we pray for your church that's gathered around the world today, people from every tribe and tongue and nation. May you be exalted and lifted up. Be with your people. Encourage and strengthen your people. We ask that the Spirit would be at work in giving life, in granting faith, in applying truth to our hearts. We ask that those who do not know you would acknowledge their sin and trust in you. Father, we ask for our nation. There's so many things going wrong in our world, in our land. We have an election year coming up. So we ask that you would grant us peace with one another in our nation and around the world. We ask that you would give wisdom to the voters. We ask that you would give our leaders wisdom. I ask for President Biden that you would strengthen him to carry out the task given to him. I ask for the United States Congress that they would work together to make laws that are good and right, that support justice. I ask for Governor Abbott, for the leaders of our state, for Mayor Nirenberg, our city council. We ask that they would care about true justice and righteousness and that we would be free to live peaceable and quiet lives in this world. That we would exalt you. That we would make your name known. Father, I ask for our church family, for those who can't be here this morning, people dealing with sickness, with various ailments, people struggling with different challenges, hurts and loss. Be with your people. Help us to be a blessing to them. 
and return them to us quickly. Father, again, I ask for this time in your word that it would be edifying to your people, that it would be encouraging and challenging and cause us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. In Romans 1 through 4, justification is explained. We are justified by faith. We are reconciled to God by faith. In Romans 5 through 8, God's people are given assurance. We know with confidence that we are reconciled to God. Nothing can separate us from God's love. We are absolutely secure in God. You know, this is the problem with having props. Like, that was supposed to come out later when I said grace and all the balloons fly up. Thank you, Tommy. I I didn't see it. I looked for it before the sermon started and didn't see it over there. Uh, Romans 9 through 11 addresses the question, then, what about Israel? If we're secure in God, how come Israel is not being saved? Why isn't Israel receiving the blessings of the new covenant? Because in the New Testament era, most of Israel is not being saved. Uh, On Pentecost, uh, thousands joined the church, and those were almost all Jews, but thousands more in Jerusalem did not. As the gospel spread, the the majority of Israel rejected the gospel. Paul always preached to the Jews first. That was his practice to go to the synagogue. But he was almost always rejected by all but just a small group. Uh, To continue the language of the Old Testament, only the remnants believed, only the elect believed. And then after he was rejected by the Jews, Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles. And so the result is that by the end of the New Testament era, uh, the majority of the church is not Jewish, but Gentile. As best as we can tell, the majority of the church in Rome was Gentile, not Jewish. And we saw last week that this is not because Israel has not heard. Their problem was not a lack of knowledge. Their problem was unbelief. Their problem was that they pursued righteousness by works, instead of receiving God's righteousness by faith. God held out his hands to a disobedient and contrary people, and they rejected him. And so that's the situation that we're dealing with. Israel has rejected God, therefore outside of his covenant promises. And that brings us to today's issue, which is whether Israel has been completely rejected. Israel stumbled over the stumbling block, which is Christ, but have they fallen to their final death, or is there hope for Israel? And there are two central questions in today's text. Is Israel's rejection full, and is Israel's rejection final? Which is to say, has has all Israel been rejected, and has Israel been rejected for all time? And the answer to both of those questions is an emphatic no. No. Paul says, by no means, may it never be, absolutely not. God will never reject or lose a single one of his people. Now, we're going to see three key themes in our text this morning. First, God will never reject his people. Second, God will never allow his people to fall fatally. But then third, God requires his people to live by grace through faith. So God will never reject his people, God will never allow his people to fall fatally, but God requires his people to live by grace through faith. And you may have noticed that those realities are a little bit in tension with each other. If God will never reject, and if he'll never allow his people to fall fatally, how can he also require something of them? What happens when something is required of someone and they fail? Right, if something is required to maintain something that cannot be lost, what happens when the requirement is not kept? Right, we'll just deal with that tension when we get there. But first key theme, God will never reject his people. God will never reject his people. We see this right beginning in verse 1. Has God rejected his people, I ask? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. 
God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's, wor- God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God will never reject his people. Has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. God has not rejected his people. He will not reject his people. God cannot reject his people, for then he would be faithful, unfaithful to his covenants. But not everyone connected to the covenant community is actually part of the covenant community. Not everyone who is around God's people is actually part of God's people. Or to use the, the language of Romans 9 verse 6, Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Well, not all Israel are Israel. Well, then who is Israel? How can we know who Israel really is? There is a human perspective and a divine perspective. From the human side, true Israel are those who believe in the promises of God. True Israel are those who trust in God's Messiah. True Israel is everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ. We could also look at it from God's side. From God's side, true Israel are those whom God elected. True Israel are those whom God set aside. True Israel are those whom God chose to save. Those are God's true people. We can refer to Israel as all the ethnic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, but only as a general people group, not as the true people of God. The true people of God are those who are joined to God by faith. Now, there are benefits to people who are just culturally connected to God's people. Uh, There are cultural blessings that are intrinsic to living among God's people. So we shouldn't undermine the reality that people adjacent to God's people have many advantages and and might even look externally like they are part of God's people. But God's people are not everyone who is in the broader family. God's people are those whom God has elected, whom he therefore called, who therefore trust in Jesus Christ. Now some of God's people have not yet trusted in Christ, but they most certainly will in God's time and plan. And God will never reject them. Now, Paul uses himself as the first example that fits both categories. He's, a, he's in Israel, and he is true Israel. So it's true that many in Israel are not true Israel, but Paul himself is an Israelite, child of Abraham, child of Benjamin. Israel will continue because of people like Paul. But then Paul specifically highlights that he is saved not because he is in ethnic Israel, but because God foreknew him. Because Paul is one of those whom God chose to set his love on and to save. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, whom he chose and loved. Every one of God's people will be saved in the end. And Paul himself is proof that God has not rejected all Israel. God has not rejected his true people. Paul gives us a second example in the person of Elijah. Uh, You may remember the narrative of Elijah calling down fire from heaven to light up his sacrifice to God that he had doused with water. And meanwhile, the priests of Baal can't get their God to answer them. It, It is a moment of great victory for Elijah. But immediately after this, the queen threatened Elijah's life, and so he he fled. And as he flees, he pleads to God that he's the last man standing. Elijah feels like he is the only person still following after God. But God reveals that there are 7,000 men that God has preserved for himself. Now, 7,000 men is a relatively small amount compared to Israel's size, but it is way more than just Elijah, way more than one man. It is 
a large remnant of people, but it is only a remnant. And the same is true in Paul's day and in our day. God has a remnant that he has chosen by grace that will certainly be saved. God has a remnant that he has chosen by grace that will certainly be saved. Verse 5, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. Just as in Elijah's day, so in Paul's day, and so in our day, God has preserved a remnant by grace. God's choice is not based on our works. It's not based on our doing. Uh, If it were based on our actions, it, it would not be a gift. If it were based on our actions, it would not be grace. But it is by grace. It is God's choice because of God's love toward us. God has a remnant that he has chosen by grace. Just as a reminder from our recent week studying in Romans, none of us would choose God. None of us would seek after God. None of us sought after righteousness. And so if God did not act to save, all of us would continue in rebellion against God. All of us would continue defying God. We would deserve judgment. So God is not doing something to make us act contrary to ourselves. We all have hearts that are hard against God. And so when God hardens our hearts, he merely strengthens our will to continue in our own natural desires. God merely gives us over to what we already want. But God, in grace has chosen to save some. God has chosen to save a remnant who otherwise, apart from his choice, would just continue in sin. But while God does save a remnant, he hardens others and they reject him. And we see that in these next several verses. God saving a remnant while hardening the rest is in fact his consistent pattern. God saving a remnant while hardening the rest is his consistent pattern. We saw that with Elijah. Now Paul gives us two more examples from the Old Testament. Uh, One that is kind of parallel to passages both in Deuteronomy and in Isaiah, and then the other is a more direct quote from the Psalms. Verse 7, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. Now Paul could be kind of going between paraphrasing and quoting from both Deuteronomy and Isaiah here, but the the situations he's talking about are similar. The people have been unfaithful. The people have failed to trust God. They have failed to honor God, and God caused them to continue in their unbelief. God hardened some. He gave them a spirit such they could not understand. They were blind and deaf. They could not see or hear because God hardened them. Not all Israel is true Israel. Elect Israel did obtain righteousness by faith, but the rest were hardened. Unbelieving Israel failed to obtain the righteousness it was seeking because it sought that righteousness by works of the law, rather than by faith. King David proclaimed the same thing in Psalm 69. Uh, Verse 9, and David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So in that context from Psalm 69, God's enemies are oppressing David as God's anointed. They're oppressing God's people. Uh, If you remember the story of David's life, the enemies who opposed David were actually often Israelites themselves. King Saul and his followers, internal uprising like uh, David's own son uh, Absalom. Yeah, Absalom. So the enemies here are quite possibly Israelites. And David asked God to cause them to stumble. 
David asks God to keep them from seeing. A prayer that we trust was answered. God saving a remnant while hardening the rest is his consistent pattern. And this is not because God has changed his mind. It is not because some of God's people will miss out. This is because God saves all of his elect while hardening others. God saves all his elect while leaving the rest to their rebellion. God's elect, whom God has chosen, are his true people. God saving a remnant while hardening the rest is his consistent pattern. Those who are truly God's people will always be his people. Those whom God has chosen will definitely be saved to the end. Christian, God will never reject his people. So you are safe in him. Second key theme, God will never allow his people to fall fatally. God will never allow his people to fall fatally. Verse 11, so I ask... Did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Israel did stumble. That is the story of the Old Testament. It's the story of the New Testament. They stumbled over God as the stumbling stone. They stumbled over Jesus Christ as the cornerstone. There was a lot of stumbling. But according to Paul, they did not stumble in order to fall fatally, but in order to bring salvation to the Gentiles. They did not stumble in order to fall forever. They stumbled to bring salvation to the Gentiles. And salvation came to the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous so that Israel will later believe. The the long-term goal of Israel's stumbling is to complete the people of God. Israel's stumbling brings Gentiles in. Their stumbling is riches for the world because the world is brought into the people of God. But Paul says what will even be better is their full inclusion. That is, Israel stumbled in order to bring in the Gentiles. The Gentiles will make Israel jealous. Israel will then believe so that all of God's people will be joined together as one full and complete people of God. People from every tribe and tongue and nation. God will never allow his people to fall fatally. So Israel did stumble but so that God would bring salvation through their stumbling. Look at verse 13. Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He pauses here to speak specifically to Gentiles. That's us. Uh, lest we think that Israel has been left behind. Quite the opposite. Paul's hope is that his fellow Jews will be jealous of Gentile salvation and thus come to faith themselves. So their rejection brought reconciliation to the whole world, both Jews and Gentiles, but their acceptance will mean eternal life. The formation, the the foundation of God's people is through the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is, the holy dough offered as first fruits in verse 16, That is the holy root highlighted in verse 16. The whole lump is holy because of its source. The whole tree is holy because of the root. Israel stumbled so that God would bring salvation through their stumbling. God will never allow his people to fall 
fade away. To close out this section, Paul gives us a metaphor that ties together how Israel could be rejected but not rejected, how Israel could stumble but not fall. And the metaphor gives both a word of confident hope and a word of serious warning. And the metaphor is the olive tree. In the olive tree, we see positively that the true people of God have life in Christ. And more negatively, we see that you only have life if you remain in Christ by faith. So first, the true people of God are safe in Christ. Verse 17, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Verse 19, then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Well, the olive tree represents the true people of God throughout time. All of God's people are the olive tree, built on the foundation of God's covenant promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel, the the physical descendants of the forefathers, that's the cultivated olive tree. Israel is the branches that, that should have, most naturally, life through the root. Believing Israel are the true branches of the olive tree. Elect Israel, God's chosen remnant within Israel, are the true branches of the olive tree. Now, unbelieving Israel is in there as well. They're they're branches that are going to be cut off. They're sort of loosely connected. They're part of Israel in some senses. They received the blessings that were for true Israel on some level. But unbelieving Israel, those who reject Jesus, doesn't actually belong in the tree. The branches are sitting there kind of loosely connected to the tree. They look like they belong, but they're actually dead. And those branches are going to be cut off. They're going to be removed. Some pruning is going to be done and some grafting is going to be done in its place. Gentiles are a wild olive tree also growing in God's orchard. But prior to the New Testament era, they're a tree that was mostly headed for destruction. A tree destined for being cut down and burned. But in God's eternal purposes, because Israel stumbled, now salvation has come to the Gentiles. And elect Gentiles are going to get cut out of that wild, unbelieving tree and grafted into the cultivated olive tree. So believing Gentiles are grafted into true Israel. We're grafted into believing Israel. We're grafted into the tree that is the true people of God. That's the olive tree. It is the true people of God. A a cultivated olive tree that has wild olive tree branches grafted in. And all of God's people ultimately are in the olive tree. We all have life through Jesus Christ. And so that's the beautiful reality that God has promised to all of his people. The true people of God have life in Christ. We are safe in Christ. Christ is the root and the source of life in the olive tree. We are connected to that root by faith. We have life. We are absolutely safe. We'll never lack 
any good thing because Christ is the source of life and we are connected to him. It's this beautiful reality that God will never reject his true people. God will not allow his people to fall fatally. If you are truly a child of God by faith, he will hold you to the end. But there's also this underlying point of tension. Now, the whole reason that this subject came up in Romans is because of Israel and their unbelief. And here in this last section, we have branches that are on the tree that get cut off. And Paul warns against pride lest you be cut off. So that takes us to our third key theme. God requires his people to live by grace through faith. God requires his people to live by grace through faith. Starting in verse 13 and really through the end of the chapter, uh, even into next week's text, Paul gives a special word to Gentile believers. As he highlights, that's the center of his own ministry. Uh, In Rome, Gentiles are a majority of the church. In the New Testament era, the gospel is mostly going to Gentiles, but Paul pauses to give Gentile believers a word of warning against pride. Do not be proud because you are not the natural branches. Israel are the natural branches, not you. They were cut off to graft you in, true, but they are native to the tree and you are not. And you weren't grafted into the tree because of some worthy thing about you. You weren't grafted into the tree because God was really impressed by you. No, remember, you were grafted in by grace, not by works. You were grafted in by faith, not by works. There was nothing good about you that commended you to God. It was because of God's grace that he gave you faith. You don't support the root. The root supports you. The tree is not given life by you. You have life because of the tree. You're simply the outward branches receiving nourishing from the thicker branches that came before you. There's nothing about God's grace that should cause pride in you. If you understand grace at all, you understand there's no place for pride in your salvation because there's nothing you did to earn it. Do not be proud because you're not the natural branches. Also, do not be proud because you too will be cut off if you do not live by grace through faith. This is the challenging reality. Verse 19 again. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. Do not be proud, he says, but fear. Those other branches were broken off because of their unbelief, that they didn't really belong in the tree of faith. You stand fast through your faith. But if you do not truly believe, you too will be cut off. If God would cut off natural branches because of their unbelief, how much more will he cut off unnatural branches because of their unbelief? Right? God requires us to live by grace through faith. If you do not recognize that salvation is of grace, if you reject God's truth that is available to you, then you too will be cut off. This is a real warning. This can really happen. There are people who believe they are Christians who are not really Christians. There are people who claim the name of Christ at one point in life who later reject him. It's actually become so common in our culture that we have a name for it, right? The deconstruction movement is filled with people who at one time would have called themselves Christians, but who have today rejected God's word. They have walked away from the faith they once claimed. They have walked away from the source of life. 
So how do we resolve the tension between these two claims? Can God's people be cut off or not? Are we safe or not? And here's the answer. God's true people are safe. God's true people are absolutely safe. Those who are not actually God's people are not safe. God's true people cannot be cut off. That's Romans 5 through 8 makes it very clear. The assurances of the first half of chapter 11 make that very clear. God's elect will be saved to the end. God will never reject his people. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But there are many people who are adjacent to Christianity. They're around Christianity, maybe even in churches but whose lives will eventually reveal that they do not know Christ at all. Maybe they grew up in the church, spent a lot of time with Christians, know the Bible, know the language. They affirm some aspects of Scripture, but they reject it in the end. There were many in Israel like this. They lived in and among the people of God, but they had no personal faith. They sought righteousness through works of the law rather than through faith. And what sets the groups apart in our human lives is whether you continue in the faith. Some reject God's truth and they fall away. But those who belong to Christ will never fall away. And for God's people, warnings like this one are one way that God keeps us in the faith. God warns us that the temptation to abandon the faith is real. The temptation to defy God is real. The Old Testament is filled with testimonies to this reality. Our own culture in our own day is filled with testimonies to this reality. But God's word is sufficient for us. God has warned us so that we will study his word and trust him. God has warned us so that we will examine his truth and believe it. You know, there was a time when some Christians taught that what Christians should do is just have an unquestioning faith that never digs into truth in any real depth. But the reality is quite the opposite. God's word is sufficient for our deepest questions. The more intensely you study scripture, the more comprehensive you find it. The more penetrating your questions of scripture, the more exhaustive you find it. If you're tempted to abandon the faith, God says, beware. We must continue in God's kindness. We must continue in the faith. We face the same kinds of temptations today that Israel did. Other gods, other idols, look to the mercy of Jesus Christ. We have a big cultivated tree that needs pruning. Lots of dead limbs around, but we also have a wild tree whose branches need to get grafted into a better tree. And God works to ensure that all his people are connected to the source of life, which is his son. Everything else, everyone not connected by faith is cut off and tossed away so that we have one true people of God And everyone who belongs to God will be held firm to the end. God will never reject his people. God will never allow his people to fall fatally. God requires his people to walk by grace through faith. And we praise God that in Jesus Christ, he gives us what he demands of us. And so it is God himself who enables us to live by grace through faith. Let's pray together. Father, we're reminded how easy it is for people to walk away, for people to abandon the truth, for people to reject reality. We praise you that you sent your son to rescue us. We ask that we cling to him 
by faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand again as we join together in singing unto the Lord, grace greater than our sin. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.